On the first day of March 1975, James Widow Doris Nyambura left Nairobi for their home in Gilgil. JM remained in Nairobi. Later that day, JM was seen at a local casino before leaving in the company of Ben Gethi. Ben Gethi was the commandant of the powerful paramilitary crack unit, the General Service Unit. That was the last time JM was seen or heard from. <laughs> And we were, we were being told by some messengers, you knew James since yesterday, left his car at Hilton, a Mercedes car. And we are being told by the, 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 the messengers from Hilton are asking where he is. He would, not, he would come in the park, go and uh, have his meals and drink with the friends and then go. But this time, he left that car there. The last person to be seen with outspoken Nyandara member of parliament being the commandant of the dreaded General Service Unit. News of JM Karaoke missing spread far and fast. The country was on the edge, emerging from a political assassination of another powerful figure, cabinet minister Tom Boyer. Unresolved political issue between the loyalist Kenyatta government that had taken over power in Kenya and those who had brought about independence. And Kenyatta was breaking those promises, as were others. And so there is the assassination of the general and the refusal to negotiate with those coming out of the forest. He, for example, was the only politician, particularly from the central province, uh, who went to the funeral of the late Tom Boyer, who had been uh, killed in a similar manner. And uh, because of that, again, he made even more enemies from the same people who didn't like what he was doing, out of in a Yeah. Uh, and at the end, he was a musician. So that is the kind of person we are talking about. Yeah. He did fear. He knew he was the only one, and he had to go all the way to Rusinga Island to the funeral of his colleague. The government was suddenly under pressure from parliament to explain the whereabouts of JM Karaoke. The then Vice President Daniel Toroi teacher up Moi told parliament that JM Karaoke had traveled to Zambia for official business. Moi doubled up as the Minister for Home Affairs and lead of government business on the floor of parliament. Well, I, I heard that he was missing uh, through our High Commissioner in Nairobi because he knew that I was a friend of, uh, of, of JM. So, since I was the Minister of Foreign Affairs at that time, he got in touch with my office to notify them that the minister's friend is missing. Uh, he hasn't been seen. And then when the story broke out, I think it was either in the Nation or in the Standard, not quite sure, one of these two, maybe even in both, that he was visiting Zambia, visiting me in Zambia. Uh, when I had actually seen him off before I left for the Far East, um, my office then contacted me that he was missing. I was still in New Zealand at the time. And when I got to the Philippines, that is when I heard that now uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was actually uh, uh, still missing and there were reports that uh, he was with me here in, 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 at, uh, in Osaka. Uh, so I, uh, I was a bit agitated by that because I felt that, you know, the, uh, I realized immediately that something sinister must have happened because he had just been to visit Zambia and he had left before I left for the Far East. How come that now they were reporting that, you know, uh, he, he was in Zambia visiting me when he had already left Zambia? Where was J.M. Karaoke? Was J.M. Karaoke missing or had something worse happened to him?
There was awkward silence from JM's senior friends, now turned enemies in government. Kenyatta's inner circle included senior superintendent of police, Arthur Wanyoke Thungu, the present personal bodyguard, a shadowy, even sinister figure. Biuko Inange, the Minister of State, never left President Kenyatta's side until his death. Mbiu wielded so much power that those around Jomo Kenyatta Times thought the president had shared with him classified state secrets. Bruce Mackenzie's Kenyatta's agriculture minister had a run-in with the Nyandaro member of parliament, J.M. Karioki, in the past. Early in 1969, J.M. took advantage of the minister's absence and sacked seven expatriates employed by his boss, Bruce Mackenzie. Mackenzie cancelled his trip and flew back home, an enraged man. He wrote letters to all the expatriates. He had calculated their salary arrears and what was, ever, was due, whatever benefit. I think the PSO was, uh, whoever it is, had been, he had instructed him to do that job, give him a proper exercise. And that's what happened. Sujem sent checks with those letters to each expatriate executive, terminating the, 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 the contract. The cabinet did not disown JM's decision to fire the seven experts. Mackenzie never forgave JM. JM Karioki's widow says the first person she called was her co wife, Terry Karioki. That's why I kept getting the team with the following day. I came out with a new equipment and I'm not even sure if I'm going to be able to meet them. That's why I'm not even sure if I'm going to be able to meet them. But JM was not coming back. JM was missing and the cabinet did not disown him. But JM was not coming back. JM was missing and the country was demanding for answers. This was 10 days after he was reported missing. I was like, I was like, I was like, Ben Gethi, a dreaded figure around Jomo Kenyatta, was the last person to be seen with the Nyanaro member of parliament who had now run into trouble with the Kenyatta administration. Just days before JM went missing, a bomb had gone off at the OTC bus station in downtown Nairobi. 27 people had died. A former permanent secretary in the Kenyatta administration told Case Files, moments after the bomb blast, JM walked to him and told him the blast was meant to divert attention. JM told the permanent secretary, who had hosted him in Karen for an evening cocktail party attended by several senior government officials, that it was the main target. The blast was meant to prepare the country for the worst. J.M. Karioki's murder. If these things are planted as we did think they were planted, then why was the government planting them if it was not involved? J.M. had on the morning of his disappearance gone to the Hilton Hotel in his private vehicle. The member of parliament took up his favorite sport where he was served by a man he knew too well. Those who knew J.M. Karioki described him as a fiery politician who rarely took prisoners. J.M. will at times travel across the country for fundraisers, an undertaking that was in some circle viewed as an exclusive privilege of the present Jomo Kenyatta at the time. J.M. was one politician who openly spoke about the rising numbers of poor Kenyans, openly spoke about the promises the government had made to a younger nation that was now 12 years old, a situation he famously captured as a country of 10 millionaires and 10 million beggars. J.M. Karioki's widow told Case Files she was later informed that the body of a man had been booked at the city mortuary. At the time, the government had insisted several times that J.M. had traveled to Zambia for an official visit. When Vice President Daniel Moy, who was in charge of the police and home affairs docket, stood up to speak, he was cut short by screaming women. J.M. Karioki's widows had managed to sneak into parliament and were shouting from the public gallery. When he comes and reads that or states that, 
James' wife scream in the balcony. You see, his body is in the city mochali. Don't tell Kenya lies. Moy was so affected. I saw him when I was in the house. He couldn't speak anymore. The only person last told me said, if that be true, then this country is in danger. James' body had been discovered in a thicket in the outskirts of Gong Town. The country was caught up between fear and death. Josiah Mwangi Karaoke was a dead man. His daughters, hundreds of kilometers away in a missionary school in Kitale. I remember one of them as soon as they got into the car, that is Rosemary. And she said, it is Kissinger, isn't it? And then she said, well, they found him, but unfortunately he's dead. Just like that. I cannot tell you for the next few minutes exactly what happened, but I remember crying. The journey of a man who, at only 46 years old, had had an illustrious political career, had come to an abrupt and tragic end. What followed was a government racing against time, time to cover up a murder that had been orchestrated from within and executed under the watch of senior officials. Josiah Mwangi Karaoke was dead. His body lay at the city mortuary, but his story had just started to unravel. For 12 days, Josiah Mwangi Karaoke was a missing man. The nation failed to capture the mood of a government that was out to eliminate dissenting voices. Eazalia, another prominent politician, Tom Boyer, had been assassinated. Case Files continues next week.